Let's now return to the measures of incoherence. So just to recap, the measure of incoherence of a cluster is basically the amount of variety there is, right? So the amount of variability we had looked at, uh, you know, essentially the squared deviation, some of the squared deviations, that's all it is, okay? So coherence means the cl cases are close to the means, meaning they're all very similar, therefore they are very close to the mean. Uh, and the measure is simply the squared deviation from the mean, the sum of the squared deviations from the mean. So that's really it. We've already looked at it earlier. So for cluster one, you've got the squared deviation from the mean. The mean is uh, 9.78. Okay, since we are squaring it, it doesn't matter whether you put 8.9 or 9.78 first. Uh, so it's basically 9.78 minus 8.9 whole squared, 53.62 minus 53.7 the whole squared. Okay, that is the amount of squared deviation for the first case. And we do the same for all the cases and total it up. Okay, and this is basically, of course, as we already pointed out, this is a square of the distance, because square root of this is the distance. So this is a square of the distance. Uh, and therefore, because distance is involved, we need to think about standardization. Okay, so attributes with big spreads can dominate the computations. With big spreads and attributes with big values can dominate the contributions, computations. And therefore, of course, as we have already discussed, we need to normalize the values, which is to replace each value by its z score which is x minus mean divided by standard deviation okay so because we are using distance as a measure of similarity we need to normalize the data so this is the measure of incoherence or the amount of variety in cluster 1 okay so here we are now dealing with the standardized values as opposed to the original values right in fact we had uh, some several slides earlier we had computed the standardized values by doing x minus mu by sigma. So these are the standardized values of the age and standardized values of the heights. Okay, And these represent cluster 1. That's why they all seem to be negative. Remember in cluster 1, all the values were the lower end of the ages and the lower end of the heights. That's why all of these values are negative because they all are all below the mean. Okay, So this is the squared deviation of age. Okay, That is a... a age minus mean divide whole squared and squared deviation of height so that's the total squared deviation this is the total of all the deviations that is this is nothing but the measure of variability calculated on the standardized values okay uh, another name for that is what is called within ss or within sum of squares that is sum of squares within a cluster that's why it's called within ss the reason i'm using this terminology is when you use r and perform cluster analysis, you'll see that it reports within SS and so on. Okay, so again, similarly, we compute the measure of incoherence of cluster 2. And here again, we work with the standardized age and standardized height, not with the original age and original height, because we already know that can be problematic. Here, you're seeing all the values are positive, because this is the second cluster in which all the people are above average height and above average age. Okay, so the within sum of squares for this happens to be 1.0815. Okay, so now we have looked at the measure of incoherence or variability within the first cluster, which is 0, uh, 0 0.9567, and the second cluster, which is 1.0815. Now let's look at the same variability for the overall data. Right, so this is all the cases, including in the first and second cluster. Of course, on top are the variables from the uh, or the values from the first cluster. Bottom are the values from the second cluster. If you perform the same operation there, you find that the total variability for the entire data is 22. Okay, and that is called as total SS. Okay, it's the same computation, sum of squares, but only thing is you're doing it with the whole data, so it's called total SS. Okay, so that variability is 22. Whereas, when you got the variability, so this is the variability for all the data. This is the variability or within SS for cluster 1. And this is the within SS for cluster 2. Again, I've just pulled it out from the previous slides. Okay, So you see that you had a total SS incoherence in the original data of 22. Okay, Whereas, the incoherence in the two clusters, if you add them up, is just about 2. Okay, So the amount of incoherence is very low in the two clusters. That means the cases in each of these clusters are very close to each other. That's what it says. Okay, So you have reduced the incoherence by a considerable amount. 
So how much complexity reduction have we achieved? We started with 12 objects. If you did two clusters, you're now down to just two clusters, which is like looking at two objects, right? So if you look at the two clusters and represent each cluster by simply its mean, so basically you're saying that your original data of 12 different objects is now represented by six objects with the mean uh, age, with the mean standardized age of this, with the mean standardized height of this, and six objects with the mean standardized age of this and the height of this, okay? Now, don't worry about the fact that the numbers have come out exactly as one positive, one negative. That's just an artifact of how the data was generated. In general, it need not be like this. Also, very importantly, uh, it doesn't mean that when you do cluster analysis, the clusters have to be of the same size. Not at all necessary. In this example, it just turned out to be so. That's all. So we are saying that as a result of the cluster analysis, we can see the data as just two clusters represented by the means of the values in those clusters. And if you try to take this back to the original data, you say, okay, I have six cases uh, which represent the first cluster whose mean age is this and mean height is this. And I have another six cases whose mean age is this and mean height is this. Okay, that is because we are trying to say that we can view the 12 objects as just two different objects. That's the amount of reduction that we have achieved in complexity. How much of variance have we retained from the original data? Remember one of our earlier criteria was, I want to reduce the complexity quite a bit while retaining the variability of the original data. Okay, so now if you look at the, at the clustered solution, we are saying the clustered solution is like six of this and six of this, right? Six of the middle of the first cluster and six of the middle of the second cluster, okay? Because we are saying, I'm, I'm going to break it down into clusters and view each cluster as simply consisting of identical values with the mean, that's it, right? So that we don't have to worry about the variability within the cluster. We'll treat all of the cluster as just basically the same. Okay, so if you do this and you calculate the variability, which is the within SS for this uh, whole data, if the data were just made up of the clusters, then you see that the within SS there is 19.96, right? Remember, for the original data, the total SS, or if you think of that as one cluster, the within SS was 22, right? So of the 22, we have retained almost 20 of the variability while dropping down the complexity from uh, from 12 down to 2. Okay, so this is like godsend the way, of course it happened that way because the data was hand created, but this is really what we are looking for. A significant reduction in, comp in complexity, that is you want to find only very few clusters relative to the total number of cases, and yet you want this to represent the variability. Okay. So that's what we've uh, achieved and it's fantastic, right? So this is what I had pointed out earlier, six of this, six of this, that's the clustering solution and the overall variability is 19.96. So that's terrific, right? So how much of, uh, from 12 objects, we went down to two clusters, but we retained 19.96 of the total SS of 22, right? Or in other words, we still manage to retain 90% of the variability in the data while reducing the complexity by one sixth. That's a good deal. So effectively, uh, what we are trying to do with cluster analysis, this is, but in k-means clustering, it's a specific method of clustering. We want to try and say upfront, I want to take the data and create k clusters. Okay, so given k, find k clusters to minimize the total incoherence, right? In other words, find k highly coherent clusters. But the point is, how do you determine the value for k, right? Now, if the data was simple, like the example we had, I could say, well, looks like two clusters is a good idea, okay? But if the got a large data set, and if you've got many, many dimensions to it, it's not just two dimensional, then how do we go about and determine upfront what is the value of k, okay? In reality, the way the process works is you try many different values of k and then you choose, okay? So what you might do in the present example is 
you would first of course if you have only one cluster that is what this line is right you just have one cluster then of course the total sum of squares was 22 we saw that and we also saw that if you had two clusters the the sum of the uh, the sum of squares of each of the clusters, the within SS of each of the clusters, you add it up, it came to close to 2, right? That's here. So when you went from one cluster, which is all the data as one cluster, and you went to two clusters, you found there was a huge drop in the uh, total, uh, in, this, in the sum of squared within SS added up across the clusters. Okay, that's a fantastic gain, just increasing by one cluster, you got that gain. Subsequently, you find if you go from 2 to 3, the reduction is not that great. Okay, so the, the big reduction you get is here from 1 to 2. And normally, in many applications, you will find these kinds of graphs. You know, when people are trying to find the correct spot, they have some measure of attractiveness and they'll see the place where that drop is the steepest. Okay, sometimes this is referred to as the elbow criterion to represent the elbow of the hand, right? A bent hand, you see an elbow, that's what this looks like. So sometimes people use elbow criteria, criterion as, uh, you know, they name this as elbow criterion. So in this case, I can say I'm getting the best benefit when I go to two clusters, so that's what I'm going to take. But in a, in a different context, one doesn't always have to go with what appears to be the best here, because after all, this is subjective. So for example, suppose a company has, you know, 100,000 customers and it's trying to create uh, do cluster use cluster analysis to group these customers into let's say 10 clusters right why 10 because they think 10 is a good number to have as a, a grouping of customers that i can handle 10 different groups okay i have let's say managerial power to manage these 10 groups in terms of advertising in terms of promotion etc okay so they just determine 10 is a good number and they go ahead and they use this and find, uh, you know, maybe they may find that 8, you know, beyond 8, there's really no additional value at all. So they may say, I'll go with 8, right? Or they may find that if at 11, there's a fantastic drop. So maybe they'll go to 11. So practical considerations as well as uh, analysis with the, with the elbow criteria both work together, right? So this is the process by which you actually identify how many clusters seems to be good for the data that we have. So again, just to be sure that we understand this graph properly, this point represents a single cluster with all the cases. Okay, so that is the total SS for uh, if you have the data as one single cluster. Okay, and this extreme, of course, not 10, if you had gone all the way up to 12, then that would represent the other extreme of having each case in its own cluster. It won't happen at 10, it'll happen at 12 because our data has 12 cases, but this 10 itself is close to zero. Okay, obviously, if you have each case in its own cluster, the total SS is going to be zero. Uh, within SS for every cl cluster is going to be zero and therefore the total uh, SS is going to be zero. Okay, so that's what is going on here. Okay, so the process again is, as I've already pointed out, you run the algorithm for many K values and choose a good value based on your criteria. Okay, so now let's go and look at how this works with our code. So, uh, because we are going to scale the data, I have provided a convenience function called dar2ed-scale-many.r. This is my function. I have provided this function. And if you downloaded and installed the code for the book, you will have this function already. Uh, so, you need to source in the function. And again, another function, which uh, is dar 2 ed dash k means plot, which is the one that generates the previous elbow graph. Okay, so you need to source in this as well. Okay, just to clarify, how do you source in a function? Okay, so the first thing we want to do is, here are the two functions, right? I'm, I'm looking at our studio. I'm looking at my default directory, working directory. And there I see these two functions, dar 2 ed dash k means dash plot dot r and this one. Right. So what you need to do first is click on one of the functions. Okay. So here I seem to have clicked on uh, on the function dar 2 edkbeans.plot. So once you click on it, the function definition which I wrote will appear on the screen. Don't worry about the details of the function. Right. We haven't learned enough R to fully understand this function. Uh, however, 
in order f because you know before you can use the function you need to have the function available in R to make it available in R you say source okay so when you click the source button what happens is R executes the code in the entire file right this is different from what we've been doing till now running code line by line by pressing run so here you press source and R executes the complete source file and once it executes the complete source file the function gets defined so after that point the function named dar2ed.kmeans.plot that function is available for us to use till such time as you complete the sourcing the function would not be available after sourcing the function is available okay so you do that first for both the functions right so here I'm showing you that I have done it for both of those functions okay so once you have done that uh, this is showing you the other function k means plot okay uh, then you can start running the code okay so the code is going to look like this I'm just reading the data the data for uh, the example that we used it's called hwcluster.csv again if you have downloaded the data for the book you should have it on your working directory so once you read it the data is read into a data frame called hw and the first thing you need is to scale the data which is standardize the data right remember in uh, cluster analysis works with distances and when it comes to distances you need to standardize it and this is a function uh, r has a function called scale which can scale a single column right but here I want to scale all many columns together so again this is a function I wrote the name of the function is dar2ed.scale.many and then hw comma 1 2 hw is the data frame and 1 colon 2 basically says scale the first and the second columns okay so you to the scale.many function you indicate which columns you want to scale so here I'm saying scale the first and the second column of course there are only two columns in the file okay so after you perform that scaling what will happen is the resultant data frame HW will now have four columns the original columns unscaled values and two new columns uh, the, which contain the scaled values so those obviously will be columns three and four okay so now I'm going to run the k-means method okay so this time I'm illustrating for you how to run the k-means function for one value of k okay so we'll just do it with two but of course I had told you earlier that your method would be first to run it for many values and choose but here I'm just demonstrating how you would run it for a single value okay so the name of the function is k-means and uh, you're saying the columns to use are columns three and four right because we want to do cluster analysis only on the scaled values not on the unscaled values and columns three and four they contain the scaled values comma and how many clusters do you want so I'm saying two we want two clusters okay so once you do this R will uh, do the job and show you the results and of course the results are stored in a variable called fit right because the result of this analysis I'm putting it into a variable called fit okay so I've got fit if you just type that it shows you k means class this is the output of R K means clustering with two clusters of size six and six okay that happened because that's just the way our data was right and then it is showing you the means of the two clusters cluster means 0. Point, minus 0. 0.882353 and minus uh, you know 0. 0.940 it's, these are the means of the two clusters and clustering vector right what it's telling you is within the data frame it just so happened that the first six values fell into the first cluster the next six values fell into the second cluster again this is just of how, this is just how the data was it's not necessary that uh, you know that there be any sequencing between the values right it's possible that the first value was in the first cluster second was in the second cluster maybe third and fourth were in the first cluster fifth and sixth happened to be in the second cluster and so on right it just you know the way I had created the data it just so happened that the first six went into one cluster and the other six went into another cluster okay so here we are seeing the within cluster sum of squares that is within SS for 
each of the clusters. It's showing you 0 0.956 and 0 1.08. <coughs> okay. And here it is showing you the ratio of between SS by total SS. Okay, that is between SS is basically the addition of these two, uh, not of these two. Of you know, if you looked at the at the clustered solution as six of this and six of that, and you calculated the the variability, you got 19.96 divided by total SS is 22, and that is 90.7 percent. Okay, and then here it's telling you what are the other attributes available within this variable called fit. Okay, uh, these are explained in greater detail in the book. If you read the book chapter on cluster analysis, it will go through everything that we've gone through in the lecture. Plus, if you work through the lab, you'll see the complete details of uh, how all of this happens and an explanation of what each of these things is. Okay, now we are going to do the actual approach of trying out cluster analysis for many values of K and selecting the K. Okay, so to do that, we use the functions dar 2 edkmeansplot right? This will generate that elbow plot that we had spoken about earlier. And uh, for this, notice that I am able to pass the unscaled values. Okay, I am able to pass the unscaled values. Okay, that is because this function takes care of scaling as well. Okay, so this function takes care of scaling, so I am able to use the unscaled values. And of course, we already know this is what will come out. And then we find that the, we let's say we prefer two clusters, and then we go and execute the code that we had executed earlier. Of course, for that, you'll have to do the standardization yourself, because the k-means function doesn't take care of standardization. It expects us to do the standardization ourselves. So this completes our discussion of cluster analysis and k-means clustering. In order to solidify what you've learned here, Please go and read the corresponding chapter in the book. Answer the review questions. Of course, check your answers at the end of the book. Uh, and also work through the lab that I've given. It will reinforce everything that we have understood.